For nearly two centuries, societies have weighed the merits of free market capitalism and socialism. Debates continue over which system maximizes prosperity and better promotes human flourishing. Free market capitalism decentralizes economic decisions, giving individuals control over what to produce, how much to charge, and what to buy. Their decisions are informed by market prices, which convey important information about scarcity and consumer value. Proponents contend that capitalism delivers the best economic outcomes by giving individuals incentives to create and produce. Critics, on the other hand, point to the persistence of poverty in market economies and rising inequality as proof that capitalism fails to deliver broad-based prosperity. They maintain that this inequality ultimately gives the rich disproportionate economic and political power. In contrast, socialism grants the government the authority to make most economic decisions. The government chooses how to allocate scarce resources based upon what it determines to be most useful to society as a whole. Proponents argue that socialism ensures society's resources are fairly distributed. Critics claim that socialism fails to give people proper economic incentives to innovate and produce, which ultimately reduces economic opportunities for all. Opponents further argue that socialism's powerful central governments become autocratic and threaten political freedom. So which system is better for humanity? For as long as this question has been asked, the debate all too often devolves into name-calling and emotional arguments that fail to advance the discussion. And yet, it is imperative that we keep asking. The Human Prosperity Project at the Hoover Institution seeks to overcome these preconceptions. It employs analysis of free market capitalism and socialism and its many variants to assess how each system affects human flourishing. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our new speaker series of the Hoover Institution called the Human Prosperity Project on Socialism and Free Market Capitalism. I'm Scott Atlas, the Robert Wesson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, and I serve as the co-chair of this project with my colleague, Ed Lazier. My own research at Hoover focuses on the impact of government and the private sector on access, quality, and pricing in healthcare and the key economic issues related to the future of technology-based medical advances and innovation. This speaker series is based on the scholarly research and commentary written by Hoover Fellows participating in the Human Prosperity Project. The overarching goal of the project is to objectively investigate the historical record to assess the consequences for human welfare, individual liberty, and interactions between nations of various economic systems. This project is research-based with educational and policy-oriented outputs that include long form essays, short videos, commentaries, and this speaker series. The speaker series is just one of the many ways we are able to reach out and share some of the important work coming out of the Hoover Institution. Uh, as a reminder, we'll be taking audience questions. And so we encourage you to submit yours at the Q&A button, which is located at the bottom of your screen. I'm joined today by two of my esteemed Hoover colleagues, Ayan Hirsi Ali and Russ Roberts, to discuss personal freedom and the moral case for capitalism. Ayan is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and founder of the AH, AHA Foundation. She served as a member of the Dutch Parliament from 2003 to 2006. And in 2007, Ayan founded the AHA Foundation to protect and defend the rights of women in the US from harmful traditional practices. She was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2005, one of the Glamour Heroes of 2005 and Reader's Digest's European of the Year for 2005. She's the best-selling author of Infidel of 2007 and Heretic, Why Islam Needs Reformation Now in 2015. Russ is the John and Jean Denault Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He founded the award-winning weekly podcast, Econ Talk, and has created a variety of things, including rap videos on the ideas of John Maynard Keynes and Friedrich Hayek that have had more than 10 million YouTube views. His poem and animated video, It's a Wonderful Loaf, 
is an ode to emergent order. His latest book is Gambling with Other People's Money, How Perverse Incentives Cause the Financial Crisis, just published in 2019. I'd like to open the uh, session with a question to both uh, Russ and Ayan. The Human Prosperity Project focuses on understanding how different economic and political systems affect well-being. It's about using research and objective analysis to document the outcomes of the various systems. Why do you think it's particularly important to do this right now and in that way in today's world? Uh, let's start with Ayan. I think it is um, incredibly important to do it that way today because I think we live at a time in the United States of America and other Western civilization nations when um, uh, we, we seem to have forgotten, or we are dealing with a population that seems to have forgotten um, that that's the way um, that we have achieved what we have. So why is America the greatest nation on earth? Why is it the richest nation on earth? Why is it the most powerful nation on earth? Uh, we have a lot of American citizens who seem to have forgotten that we are living in an era where socialism is being promoted as if it is the cure for all problems. And um, we are about to have an election in three months and there are very prominent people, especially within the Democratic Party, who are promoting, in my view, socialist ideals that we have seen um, fail in the 20th century in so many different arenas and are failing as we speak today. So I think um, it is incredibly important today to remind young people um, you know, who we are and not just the moral imperatives, but again, to go back to the word objective, uh, what free, free political freedom and free enterprise um, have achieved and not just demonize it. Russ, do you have any uh, insight into that sort of why now and what's so important about this today? Oh, we're, <clears throat> we're living in a time of, of some economic turmoil particularly right now with, with the pandemic, but over the last five years, there's been a lot of concern about certain groups not doing well. There's a lot of concern that people aren't uh, able to rise, even though growth has been positive. I personally, as, as you know, Scott, and as many of my listeners on Econ Talk know, I think a lot of the evidence for that is selective. I think there's a lot of evidence, particularly when you follow the same people over time, you can see that they do rise with economic growth. The rising tide st still does lift all boats. But I think the, the timeliness is the, the word socialism has morphed. It's transformed to mean something closer to what I don't like about capitalism won't be there. That's my, I, I think that's why socialism does well in polls. I think a recent Gallup poll, 43% of Americans were in favor of socialism or should we consider it or, that's unimaginable five years ago, but I'm not sure what they mean by socialism. Do they mean the social welfare state of the Scandinavian countries? Do they mean the socialism of Cuba or North Korea or the former Soviet Union and its communist face? So I, I think a lot of people are dissatisfied with capitalism, uh, which I think there are, there are reasons to be dissatisfied with it. The, the crucial question is, are the shortcomings of capitalism due to capitalism or the way we particularly created our strange American current version of it. The only other thing I want to add is that uh, the thing that's timely, I think, and most important about this um, project that, that Hoover is involved in is, is in the title. It's, it's not called the Growth Project, and it's not called the Income Project. It's called the Human Prosperity Project. Human because we don't just care about money and prosperity because we don't just care about money. Yes, Prosperous has a financial side to it. We say, you know, that person's prospering, but I think we also mean something richer and deeper along the lines of flourishing, whether we can use our gifts, whether our life is satisfying to ourselves, whether we have a feeling of agency and responsibility for our own lives. And I think that's some of the most important part of capitalism, not just the financial impact Yes, it, it's really good at producing stuff, but that's not what is the essence of life once you get past a certain minimum. And I think it's incredibly important that, that we understand and appreciate what is important and effective about capitalism and giving us good lives, not just profitable lives. 
Uh, thanks, Russ. I think that's very important and uh, happy to hear that it endorses the title that we all worked on for this project. <laughs> that's nice. Thank you. Uh, let me continue with Russ here and ask something uh, specifically uh, pertinent to this session, which, Russ, can you explain what you mean by the moral imperative of capitalism and how that factors into the conversation about sort of rich versus poor in relation to capitalism? Well, it's quite complicated, of course, because what we mean by moral is a little bit like socialism. It's what uh, somebody calls a suitcase word. You can stuff a lot of stuff into that and decide what you mean by it. A lot of people say capitalism is immoral because it, appeal, it appeals to our, our grasping or self-interested side. But when I look at the morality, the case for capitalism is a moral system. I have a few things that, that I think are important. One is it's decentralized. Power is not concentrated in Washington. Power is not concentrated in the state capital, where it's subject to lobbying and special interest influence. Uh, you're free to choose, as Milton Friedman and, and Rose Friedman eloquently said. You're free to decide what to buy, what not to buy, where to work, and where not to work. And I think that freedom and what that does to your feeling as a human being is extremely important. Now, the critic of capitalism will say, yeah, well, that's great. What about the person who doesn't have a chance to get to a job, who never got the skills? And it's a terrible problem. It's a terrible problem in all systems, of course. I'm tempted to say under capitalism, man oppresses man. But under socialism, it's the other way around. But I won't say that. Uh, but I will make the point that the people who are worried about the terrible situation that many Americans face today have a legitimate worry. And that's the fact that many people are poorly equipped with skills to take advantage of the opportunities that are available in the current American economy. And I think that's an indictment, not capitalism, but of our educational system for starters, legislation that holds people back through licensing restrictions and keeps them from getting their first job, their first step on the ladder of opportunity. So I think there's a lot of things that are wrong with the American system. Some of them are unfortunate and bad luck and will occur in any system. There are always gonna be people who struggle to lead good lives. It's, life is hard. For, for in any system for lots of people. But I think the fundamental question is not just do I have the opportunity to express my skills, to choose my path in life, to have agency, what kind of life do my kids have? What kind of life will my children have? And I think that's why an important empirical piece of, of evidence is the fact that poor people come from all over the world to America, risking their lives to cross into America even illegally to give their children a chance to prosper in this system because they have a much bigger faith, I think, in America than many Americans do. That's, that's exactly, uh, that's, that's exactly right, really. Uh, Ayan, uh, you discussed the benefits of democratic capitalism and how that uh, fits in the framework of the rule of law and individual rights in your essay. Can you provide some examples where this comes into play as we witness increasing concerns with what is called social justice or social injustice? Right, yeah, and I want to follow on with what Russ said by say summarizing, um, first of all, by asserting that, you know, America and the idea of America, it's an ideal, right? It's not, we're not talking here about the perfect system. It's not utopic. And I think what distinguishes us from say the utopian socialist types is that we say what we want, the ideal is a small government. We want our government to be small. We want our government to be transparent and we want it to be accountable. And so if you ask me, does that work? Well, it does. It does for the largest number of people. It doesn't work for a considerable number of people with all the problems that uh, Russ portrayed. Um, when I look at socialist systems, it's the very opposite. Governments are large, they're opaque, and they're accountable to no one. And what you get is a whole narrative about this is what's wrong with the capitalist system. Let's eliminate it. Let's dismantle it. Let's topple it. And what do you get in return? You get big government run by a very small number of people who are held to no account. When I was a little girl growing up in Somalia, we had just um, become independent from uh, Great Britain, France, and Italy. 
and running our country, um, we were trying to experiment with different types of government. My father was leaning towards American style democracy. But here along came a strong man, army guy, and within a few years, he introduced communism, Marxism. We had large pictures of um, Marx, Engels, and Siad Barre, the uh, uh, dictator. And in a very short space of time, we had no food, no clothing. We were lining up for the most basic needs we have. And I remember that that was all introduced with that same narrative of trying to achieve social justice and trying to achieve equality. And so I think it is time that we really pay attention to what we are saying. And, and again, to Russ's point, our system is not perfect, but it is dynamic. The fact that we have problems with our education, with our legislative system, all of that, these are the conversations we have, and these are things that we work on constantly. The other system, the socialist system, is so totalitarian, it doesn't allow you to work on those um, issues. Okay, uh, let me move to something I'd like to hear from both of you on as well, which is the, the topic of justice. Uh, could you uh, could you comment, uh, both of you, first, Russ, on how socialism of the 20th century seems to be forgotten by the American people and how recent socialist proposals like the Green New Deal or Housing for All are, are somehow framed as measures to achieve justice for society? Russ? So justice is a nice word. We're all in favor of it uh, in the abstract question. What does it mean in, in practice? Uh, I've written a couple of essays where I concede that my good fortune in life is mostly not my doing. I don't deserve what I have. I was born of two wonderful parents. They raised me very well. I grew up in America. I was very fortunate. Many, many, many of the things that I am blessed with, especially financially, are things that were, I'm just lucky. Uh, so I think a lot of people worry about that reasonably and think, well, is it really fair? Is it just that I have a relatively easy financial life, a relatively easy economic situation compared to someone born somewhere else, someone born in, in terrible poverty, someone who didn't get the schools that I had to go to? I, I did work hard, but one of the reasons I worked hard is that my parents raised me to work hard. That wasn't my doing, you could argue either. So in a certain sense, there, there, there's a, there's a an aspect of luck in, in any outcome that's positive. And I think that inequality is partly what drives the socialist ideal when it's, I think, in, as a good motive. The other motive, I think, of course, is the family. Hayek pointed this out a long time ago. The, the urge for, we're all, and Walter Williams pointed this out, the family is a socialist institution. It's top down, there aren't prices, <laughs> it's not, you know, fairness is, is worked out relentlessly by both parents. So these two places, this recognition that luck plays an important role in our outcomes and our family life both pushes think we could do better than this current system. The real empirical question then is, well, how? And, and what's the evidence that that'll actually be better and turn out better? When government allocates all the resources instead of the decentralized choices made by millions and millions of people in the American economic system, more or less, would the government do a better job? You mentioned the Green New Deal. Would the government do a better job, we say, with startups, uh, environmental startups in that case, or other kinds of startups, technology for better gas mileage or other aspects of life that we might care about, medical innovation? Uh, the real question then is, is what's the evidence that the government would do that well, that it wouldn't be subject to special interest lobbying? And to my view, at least in the American system, there may be other political systems that are less prone to cronyism. Our system, I think, is prone to cronyism. I don't want government allocating all those resources. I don't think it'll do it well. You know, private sector, Hoover's in the heart of Silicon Valley, where people spend their own money trying to get either incredibly wealthy, and if they fail, they lose all their money. It's a very incentivized system. Even in that system, a lot of startups don't do well. Why would you think that the administrative state run out of Washington, D.C. or Sacramento, California, or your state capital, is going to do a good job allocating those resources? The answer is, just don't think it will. And historically, not only have centralized governments done a poor job allocating those resources, now I'm talking way beyond, say, 
social safety net. I'm talking about directing the economy, which is what a lot of people want for justice. When government does that, not only does it do a poor job, it, it encourages corruption where people use the system to get ahead, not through creating a better product, not through coming along and making people's lives better, but by advancing their interests through Washington, D.C., rather than th their product. And that, I think, is just, it's very corrupting. I don't think it's good for us. So, mm -hmm. Russ, I want to get to, um, go back to what you said about how your parents um, raised you and gave you everything you have, and you, you're almost embarrassed uh, in stating that, oh, God, I worked hard, oh, help. Um, and I don't think you should be embarrassed about that. I think you should really be proud of A, your parents, and B, your hard work. And uh, every single time that we use the word justice, I think we have to put forward, because it's a narrative. I mean, the three of us know that, but we also just make the public aware of the fact that our American system gives us, and um, it's about opportunity versus outcome. So you got the opportunity. So growing up as a little girl in Somalia, in a poor household and in Kenya, and, uh, my opportunities were very, very limited. But then having come to the Netherlands and coming to the United States, I saw, you know, not the perfect opportunity, but you know, there's, and, and this is, if you really want to achieve justice and increase, um, you know, opportunity for everyone, then I think we should continue to talk about opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. We should talk about um, not trying to perfect outcomes, which is what these people want to talk about. Um, if you read the Green New Deal very, very closely, it is all about a perfection of outcomes. But if you follow it to its logical conclusion, where it takes you is to a state of the Flintstones without the nice tune. <laughs> it's, we'll all be equal, but we'll all be equal sort of in a caveman stage. Uh, it's a spiral downwards. What we have now, even though it's imperfect, we have to work hard at it. We have the racism, we have the inequality, on it, is that it, it's a narrative of equal opportunity. So it's a well, great thing that your parents did what they did for you. What we really want is to encourage all parents to invest in the education of their children. What we want to do is improve in what's going on in public schools or in our universities. And that is why we need to have an objective to go back to the word objective. We need to have um, a critical and objective and clear eyed um, assessment of these concepts and show in an empirical way that the narrative of equal outcomes leads to only one thing, Flintstones without the tunes and the guillotine. Yeah, I'd like to move on to another question for you, Ayan, <laughs> uh, which is uh, you have a personal recollection of socialism that you refer to as scientific socialism. Can you explain to everyone what that is and how it compares to today's neo-socialism? Well, when they, um, but I was a little girl and you know, they introduced socialism. Um, so the world was divided into um, the American sphere and the Soviet sphere. And the Soviet Union at that point, they were propagating the idea of communism, which they sold in terms of justice. And they came to us and it wasn't just justice. Well, we were, you know, a nomadic pastoral um, society. And they were bringing to us science and industry. And so uh, roads were built, we saw cars, we had, um, there was only one airplane or two at most, I suppose. Um, but all this was sold to us in the name of science and objectivity. And uh, we were, you know, superstitious people and we were, uh, stupid and backward. And so scientific socialism in practice, what it meant then was that every family was going to be apportioned a certain amount of food. And I remember vividly my mother standing in the sun for hours and hours and hours waiting for a pound of sugar, a pound of flour, a pound. That was science. 
Okay, uh, let me move on to uh, Russ. In your, in your papers, and this is really for both of you, but I'll start with Russ, you mentioned the benefits of capitalism and that it offers better opportunities for an improved standard of living and an increase in human potential. Russ, uh, you particularly discussed the benefits of competition and cooperation. Uh, Ayan describes the benefits of a competitive capitalist system. Can you uh, expound on that, that thought? Yeah, but I, I, first I have to react to Ayan's beautiful story. Uh, it's a tragedy in her case. The, the version of that that I experienced was that in the early 90s, I was host to a newly arrived family from the Soviet Union who was uh, happy to arrive in St. Louis, Missouri, and we took them to the grocery store. Uh, and they, the, we couldn't speak their language. They were amazed by it. They thought they were in a museum. They'd never seen produce like this. They were so excited. And then they, the mom wanted to get some yeast because she wanted to bake some bread. You know, yeast is a very small product that mm -hmm. couldn't find where it was in the store and I couldn't find any. So I went to the, one of the managers, I said, I can't find any yeast. And he went, he looked around, we went to the place where it was supposed to be and sure enough, it was out. He said, oh, sorry about that. I'll get some from the back. And he went to the back and he brought some out and he gave it to us. And the, this, the Soviet newly arrived woman from the Soviet Union looked at me with new respect. She looked at me like this. Oh, oh yeah. they bring out the yeast. He, he's got, he's got influence. Yeah. You know, he's, he's important. I've gotten a really good family to be my host family because he's important. He gets the yeast. And of course, that's the tragedy in many ways of the system. You either wait in line as your mother did for hours in the sun. Yeah. Or when you get to the front of the line, there's no sugar yeah. or, the people who are politically powerful get the sugar without having to wait in line, which encourages you to try to become politically powerful instead of productive. And that's and the tragedy of the system. And to lie and to cheat. And so yes. you corrupt the entire society. I can't yeah. recommend enough a book called Everything Flows by Vasily Grossman. Everything Flows. It's an incredible portrait of the moral corruption of a centralized system uh, and, and that resulted in a famine that killed you know, millions of people in, in Ukraine in, in the 1930s under Stalin. Uh, but Scott, you had a question. Yeah. Oh, what was it? <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. No, I hate to interrupt the conversation, but you know, uh, the question really is uh, uh, the benefits of competition that oh, we yeah. find in a, in a capitalist system. Why don't you expound on that? Sure. So a lot of people think capitalism is this, it's, it's, it's rooted in competition. It's in the phrase you always hear is dog eat dog. By the way, I don't, do dogs eat dogs? I don't think they do. I, I don't know what kind of competition that is. It's, it's, I guess, imaginary competition. And that makes me smile, but I am, but it's not as good as your Flintstones line. So nothing will top that. Flintstones without the tunes, I, I will remember that and credit you. But under capitalism, there is competition, but that it's not the kind of thing like sports competition, which is inherently zero sum. Somebody wins and somebody loses. The competition under capitalism is businesses compete to build a better product or provide a better price for customers. And more than one can win, obviously. And certainly the customers win alongside the company. So it's nothing like that phrase competition, the way it rings in our mind. The other thing to remember about capitalism is it's got an enormous amount of cooperation. We cooperate as workers, we cooperate as investors with uh, at new, in creating new enterprises. Cooperation, the biggest way we cooperate is we have a, a supply chain that we, a web of ways that we work together to provide the underlying products. You don't have one company that tries to make everything. Instead, they rely on other companies for their raw products. Another company might rely on uh, someone else for their workers. The whole system is decentralized, and yet somehow we're all cooperating without being commanded by the czar of whatever industry we're talking about. And that cooperation takes place in an unseen way, the beauty and peacefulness of it. One last example, on Super Bowl Sunday, it's the biggest pizza day of the year. How is it that on Super Bowl Sunday, I can walk into a bakery on Sunday morning and get a dozen bagels? I should walk in and they should, the bakery should say, oh, we don't have any bagels. All the flour went to pizza. It's Super Bowl Sunday. Don't you know that? And then I'd have to write a memo to the, to the wheat czar or the flour czar to say, you know, I like bagels. Don't get, let it all go to the pizza people on Super Bowl Sunday. And yet we cooperate in, in, in allocating that, that wheat. It's not in that flour. We're, we're in competition for it, but somehow 
everybody can have it who wants it at a reasonable price. And that's a miracle that Hayek called it a marvel. It's an extraordinary part of our life that I don't have to fight with you at City Hall to get what I want. All these decisions are made peacefully and without the influence of, of me trying to get something at your expense. And that's an enormously important part of capitalism we don't appreciate. I think we don't appreciate, I think I do agree with Hayek that it, a competition is a marvel. So um, either you compete or you're envious, you're jealous of someone else, right? And you want to take what they have and destroy them. And so again, you have that spiral downwards. For me, competition, this is what it means. It means Silicon Valley. It means optimism. It means innovation. It means, it really is what has made this country great. You have something, I like it. I think I can do that. I can, I can even do it better. And if I can, I can't. And if I can't, I'm humbled. And so competition is really the great, I mean, it is the great, you see it in little boys, you see it less with little girls in a different way. Um, but I think if we can harness um, human competition, and of course, it, it doesn't need to be, you know, the dog eat dog, which I know I have never seen any dogs eat other dogs. I've seen men eat men. <laughs> Uh, but to, I think comp the word competition has been getting a bad trap and it's been getting from the grievance people. Okay, one more question for Russ before we move on to some questions from the audience. Uh, Russ, you've written books and created a lot of popular videos that are targeted to a general but even younger audience to explain these key aspects of socialism and capitalism. Uh, can you tell us how these efforts have been received? What's been the reaction? You know, have they changed the thinking of how younger people are viewing the pros and cons of capitalism? Oh, I, I, I like to think so. You, you don't always know. I, I will share a couple of reactions I got. Uh, the filmmaker John Popola and I created these, these two rap videos about the ideas of Keynes and Hayek. Uh, in both those videos, Keynes and Hayek get equal time. Uh, it's not, we like Hayek more than Keynes, but they each, uh, each person, each idea gets the same amount of lines in the song. Uh, you can find those on YouTube if you want to check them out. Just Google uh, Hayek or Keynes rap or Russ Roberts rap, you'll find them. Uh, but one of my favorite comments, uh, two, my two favorite comments, I'd say, from those videos in terms of reactions, one was, how come I've never heard of this Hayek guy? And so part of my goal wasn't to, our goal wasn't to prove that Keynes was wrong about economic policy or that Hayek is, is, is always right. Get just to get our ideas of the debate. You know, I, I like our chances when we get our ideas in the debate. So uh, that's my goal is to expose people to these ideas. You know, it's up to you, the listener, to make your own decision about what kind of life you want for yourself and your children and your neighbors uh, and your friends and your family. The second comment we got, which I always loved, was that our videos were unfair because Hayek got the last word. And I, you know, I wanted to, <laughs> I would write back and I would say, well, when you have two people, uh, one gets the last word. And you're right. We didn't flip a coin. We, we, we gave it to the one we thought was right. If you want to make a rap video where Keynes gets the last word and you give Hayek half the airtime and you're, and you're honest about what he actually believes, I'll be thrilled to watch it, promote it, and so on. So I think a lot of this is about some voices are not getting heard and they don't get heard in the uh, halls of um, economics class as much anymore. Uh, Hayek is not widely known or read. Milton Friedman isn't as widely read or known as I think he should be. So, um, you know, our job at Hoover is to try to help keep these ideas alive and we do the best we can. And you got to go with the times. You got to communicate in ways that communicate effectively to people. People like to watch videos. So I make videos. Yeah, and, and again, that also underscores something that Hoover, of course, stands for, which is really, you know, we're in this, this project also, is this is about evidence uh, and, you know, looking at things in an objective way rather than in a, a, a highly uh, assertion-based mode here. I like to always say facts matter. So I'd like to move to some questions. And again, uh, I encourage everyone to submit questions uh, in, your, in, the, in the box uh, on the bottom of your screen. The, the first question uh, is from uh, Chris. 
many posit that free market capitalism has become or always was really crony capitalism where the rich become disproportionately richer than others. Isn't the European model of free market capitalism, democratic socialism, how uh, more equitable? Uh, Ross, why don't you uh, start with this one? Well, I think there are two things to think about there. First of all, you know, crony capitalism, the idea where uh, certain businesses or industries get favors in our system, I think the financial sector tends to be uh, favored uh, in a grotesque and, and destructive way, both to capitalism and democracy. You know, I like to say Republicans and Democrats both like to give money to their friends. They just have different friends. The exception is the financial sector. They both like that group. And so they've been coddled to some a non-trivial extent in this form of bailouts in particular. And I think that's been uh, very uh, wasteful and it's demoralized a, a lot of citizens about how the system works. And those are the richest people in human history, <laughs> that, that group. So the idea that they can eat a handout is, is despicable. Uh, and so that, I don't consider that capitalism. Uh, it's crony capitalism, it's not the real thing. But having said that, m much of the rest of the American economy, it's, uh, there's a lot of people who have skin in the game who aren't being coddled, aren't being protected, have to make their own decisions, act with prudence, responsibility, and invest in their own skills and, and opportunities accordingly. So I don't think we have, a, we have some crony capitalism. I think we ought to get rid of that. To the European system, which I think, you know, their democracy, you can debate whether their democracy works better than ours or worse, but the European system has a whole separate set of problems. The most important one is that young people in that system have a lot of trouble finding work. The youth unemployment rate in the European countries are, is very high, and the consequences of that going forward are very disturbing. So when you look at the current system of Europe and say, well, they look, they look like they're doing pretty well, they're pretty happy, 10, 20 years from now, they may have a lot of dysfunctionality that, that they're going to have to deal with because a significant portion of their population has struggled to, to work or to find work. So uh, ha having said that, if you the, the European system is less dynamic, it's more secure, if that appeals to you. I understand why some people would prefer that. A lot of people in America prefer the more dynamic system. But again, I like that dynamic system when everybody has a chance to excel and that requires a first rate education system that we don't have. We see the poorest Americans desperately trying to get their kids into charter schools where they think they'll have a better chance to succeed. And there's a lot of evidence that they do. And I think we've had for 60 years an attempt to improve the current public school system in America's cities and we have failed over and over again. We need to try something different. So it's not so much to me that capitalism needs to be, needs an overhaul, our education system needs an overhaul. Yeah, I, I want to take a, I want I, to, at least let me add to that. The, go ahead. I was going to ask you. Europe, we have in Europe, we have just as much crony capitalism. There are large corporations that lobby politicians. I know they like to label their systems uh, democratic socialist, but it is anything but socialist and far from democratic. We have a huge underclass not through race, but immigration that are completely left out of the economic system. You've talked about uh, the youth unemployment. I know Scott knows a lot about the healthcare systems that are supposedly universal, but are in fact not as universal as they seem to be. So I think the grass is always greener on the other side. I would encourage every American who thinks that Scandinavia is better and the model for America to actually go and live there for a bit of time and see for themselves it's not that better. But it's important to add, and I want to add on to what you said, those Scandinavian systems are a weird hybrid mix, like our system is to some extent, of a social safety net, not socialism, a social safety net, very generous welfare benefits, very generous health care, yeah. and Good with all that- You pay 62% of taxes, go on. Right, with high taxes, but they have a lot of private enterprise in, the, in Scandinavia. So Scandinavia is not socialist. And by the way, they also have a high concentration of wealth, just like we do. People yeah. think it's some egalitarian paradise. The, the, the concentration of wealth in, in Scandinavia is, is also quite high and quite similar to ours, despite the uh, claims yeah, that it's some um, nirvana. They have the highest. It's, it's uh, just, just go, go take a look for yourself. Yeah, I want to pick up on something specifically for Ayan. Uh, 
the question uh, from Noah. You talked about equal opportunity, Ion. How, how do you create equal opportunity for the poor, the uneducated, and people of color? Education. You open up the open. First of all, I, I want to, here's what I, I'm really so proud about what we have done in America. We got rid of slavery. We got rid, we had a civil rights movement. So we got rid of the legislation that allowed segregation. And then we allocated large amounts of resources that we thought would alleviate um, the inequality. Um, but if you look at our education system, if you look at our public schools, it does make it very, very difficult for anyone, not just people of color, but even white poor people to lift themselves out of poverty. So let's A, uh, reform our pu public school systems. Once we've done that, once an individual has actually, you know, taken, advantage of that opportunity, then let's open up the universities and the workplaces and so on. And I think that conversation is taking place right now. So if you ask me, has something good come out of the current protests? I would say yes, in every boardroom, in uh, every uh, political, you know, within, among politicians, people I trust the least, these conversations are happening now. And so there is a chance where we can say, if you want real equal opportunities, stop looking up the past, let's look at the future. Let's say, what is it that we can do for young black boys who are born into an environment of such misfortune that it's so unimaginable? Single mothers, guns and violence, drugs, imprisonment. How can we lift them out? it's through that age old mechanism of education, but it has to be the real education. It's what Jason Riley calls, he writes for the Washington, uh, he writes for the Wall Street Journal. It's what he calls human capital, not political capital. Don't get these young people out and then have them rioting in the streets and joining Black Lives Matter. Give them human capital so that they can become a part of our society. And then may I please add such, um, Traits as hard work, getting up early in the morning, commitment, marriage. We are now being told that these features are whiteness. Give them whiteness. Ross, I have a question from Charles here. Uh, please comment on the relationship between capitalism and democracy. Many people conflate the two. Yet Chile under Pinochet and increasingly China under Xi are capitalistic, but clearly not democratic. Yeah, it's a fascinating question, the interaction between the economic system and the, and the uh, political system. And China is a very good example. China has a lot of capitalist elements. They're allowing a lot of enterprise. Uh, and yet a lot of China is top down. Their housing is... They're, they build, the government doesn't just build a few roads, they build cities, they build apartment, not just a building, they build complexes after complex after complex. So the Chinese system has done quite well. Uh, I think we have to concede that, even though it is somewhat top down, you could debate whether most or some of its success or almost all of it comes from the influx of capital. Literally, we're talking about capital as the influx of foreign capital, the uh, increased openness of China to investment from the West, the, not just in money terms, but in its people, enormous increases in well-being and financial well-being as uh, foreign national corporations compete for Chinese labor, driving up those wages. That's been great. So globalization, which gets you know a horrible name here, and I think s mostly incorrectly, but in China, it seems to have been mostly for the good. Uh, that their people have prospered from the uh, influx of foreign capital and investment and competition for the, for the skills of their people. So that's capitalism. How much of their success comes from the top-down part and whether that's sustainable or whether it's a bubble is, I think, still very much an open question. Um, hard to know how that's going to turn out. Yeah, uh, I have a question here from Darlin. And I think it's directed at Ayan because it says, Ayan is a personal hero. It's an honor to hear your contribution. 
the question is, how is it even possible to make this message of capitalism resonate considering the state of the mainstream media and university education? I mean, this is clearly critical uh, in the world that we're living right now. Yeah, um, it, that, it, that's a fantastic question. It is true. I mean, we are going through challenging times and um, institutions of freedom, press freedom, for instance, um, it's, it's, it's a time of great challenge. I don't want to say anything wrong about the media, but it is, um, we're all living and watching this corruption of our media. We focus on just politics. But yeah, what is happening to our universities? What is happening to our newsrooms? I think the only way really to make a change is for the silent majority to stand up and to stand up to them. It's to end the subscriptions, to end the clicks, uh, for donors to reconsider uh, who they give money to and for alumni and for parents. You know, we pay a ton of money to educate our kids. And if we could only take an interest in what it is that they are consuming. I've asked, uh, I, I talked to 21 year olds, 20 year old students, and I asked them, um, so tell me, have you read the Tocqueville? And they go, the who? Alexis of Tocqueville, never heard of. Have you read Plato? Never heard of. Um, Benjamin Franklin, yeah, who's that guy? And they, they really don't know whether he's some kind, he's connected with the Christmas tree, Dr. Seuss, or they've heard of him, but it's really vague. And if you've paid 50,000, $70,000 a year, and your kid has graduated college, and they haven't heard of those people, then there's something really wrong. And as a parent, you really should be paying attention. And maybe this is a, a good unintended consequence of COVID-19, is that maybe parents will really take an interest in what their kids are doing, what they're learning, what they're reading. Uh, Russ wants to say something, sorry. No, it's okay. Russ, do you have a comment on this? Well, I just wanted to say that, I, you know, it's funny, I don't think, um... I don't think the problem is, is really so much the media and the universities, they're not helping. And I certainly agree with Ayan that the educational system, the universities aren't so interested in education anymore is the way I would phrase it, Ayan. I think it's a, it's a terrible tragedy that, that this is a reality. It's just a fact that college, the college experience that goes well beyond uh, learning about the great ideas of, of, of the past or the present, uh, or learning history or the things that you and I would say are important for a person to be an educated citizen. Uh, I think there's something else going on, which is capitalism and, and economics generally is hard to convey. And uh, the burden's on us. The burden's on us. It's what we're, we're trying to do at Hoover. We, at Hoover, we try, and at other people who are passionate about these ideas, we try to put our ideas in a form that everyday people can understand and, and, and enjoy those ideas. Uh, and to put that, those ideas in formats that, that people can relate to. That's our job. Uh, and if America is at risk, as I think it is right now, both in many dimensions, capitalism is just one of them. The university system is one. I think the media has become uh, very self-destructive. It's a tragedy in a democracy, the way the media is splintering. It's a result of economic forces. There's nothing sinister about it, but the results might be sinister. But in this world, decent human beings, and I, I alluded to this earlier, we got to stand up, folks. You got to stand up for what you believe in. You got to speak out and you got to talk about the principles and values that you think are important. And it's true that most of us just want to go along with our lives and get our business done, but our country's at stake right now. You got to stand up and talk about what's important and, and for parents to, to make sure their children do get educated. But it's, uh, we've all got a job to do. We got to get it, get to it. I'm going to finish up with this last question, and uh, I'll, I'll start with Ayan. It's uh, combining a question from Patricio and a question from Nancy. Uh, what improvements can we make to the current system to reduce the income inequality without undermining the freedom that capitalism gives us? And the other question, which is related, is 
the idea that how can people rise up when the playing field isn't equal? Many of our service jobs are not paying a quote, living wage in the United States. Some people are having to work two and three part-time jobs just to survive. Ayan, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely not denying the challenges. But again, let's go back to where we started, which was if our government is small and transparent and accountable, then at least we can hold them accountable to where the allocation of all those enormous amounts of resources have gone. And if you ask me, I still think uh, there is a reason why thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people want to come to America because they still see that there is opportunity. There's opportunity to be had here. I talk to a lot of people who are working the two, three jobs and they say, I'm doing this now, but I'm doing this. I'm investing in the future of my children because if I can get my kid through college, then I know the next generation, our family is going to do better. America still has that, folks. We just forget that. We are being told, you know, universal free, universal this, universal, pay more free, more government, more government. And I think that a lot, we're just not paying attention. We're not looking around to see that, yeah, we have our challenges. Jobs were moved to China. Manufacturing was moved to China. A lot of immigrants came, there's a lot of automation. We have all of these problems. And I think Russ will talk to you about the technicalities of that. But there is, we still have, um, when it comes to opportunities, I still think that given our population, we have you know, enough opportunities for those who are here to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and we help them through the education system, but it will have to go back to uh, reforming our education system so that that poor woman who works two or three jobs, when she gets her kid through college, that they don't go talking about microaggressions, but that they get a real education. I think in the interest of time, I'm not gonna let Russ uh, go on, although I know he would have something to add. I, uh, at this point, you know, Ayan and Russ, uh, both of you, thanks so much for your time this morning and for sharing your thoughts on such an important and uh, really timely topic. The next session on the Human Prosperity Project speaker series uh, will be taking place on Thursday, August 6th at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and will feature Hoover Fellows Michael McConnell and John Yu to discuss liberty and federalism. On August 20th, we will focus on opportunity and income inequality. On September 3rd, we'll take a look at socialism and capitalism through the lens of two very prominent historians. You can find the Hoover Institution and more information on the Human Prosperity Project online at hoover.org. Again, thanks everyone for joining us today and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you very much, everyone.